episode 211, Science, Biomimicry and Gardening. This is the World Organic News for the week ending 27th of April 2020. John Moore reporting. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. Given the current hoo-ha we are exposed to of late, I thought it might be a good idea to go and look at the science behind no-dig gardening. As long-time listeners will know, I'm a big fan of biomimicry. This combined with the scientific method, hypothesis, experimentation, data collection and contemplation, allows us to proceed from a solid starting point. As new information is received, we can adjust our, our hypothesis and start again. The difficulty of working with natural systems is their complexity, and as such, at the extremes we have a dichotomy. One paradigm would have us measure everything, and this way leads to madness. The other paradigm is the Fukuoka approach. Leave everything to nature, adjust previous systems until they match nature. More on that later. My approach is is as follows. Measure what needs to be measured and leave the rest alone. The key then is to pick the right things to measure. Most basic, of course, would be output. We are trying to get a harvest after all. I would also include pests and diseases, water retention and weed levels as useful things to measure. After our first summer in the gardens at work, I have some preliminary data. Weed levels were extremely low due to the close plantings. Water retention was poor. We were growing and spent mushroom compost and I'll be adding more organic matter over the winter. Pests were almost non-existent. Some slugs, but not many. Diseases were confined to some rust on, a bro- on the broad beans due to overwatering, maybe, and growing them over summer. Output was a little disappointing. Plenty of cucumbers, mini pumpkins, rocket crest, sweet corn, mountains of sweet corn, beetroot and silver beet. Less impressive were the tomatoes, still in the ground and starting to produce, but the volume is not what I expected. The mini cabbages did not produce at all. The lettuce went okay, but bolted way too soon. This may be put down to the dry hot spell we had from mid-November to mid-January. The potatoes succumbed to a fungal infection, which uh, I should have perhaps pre-thought of, but not seeing how the ground was prepared, I didn't realise what had been churned up in there. Uh, We managed to get our seed weights of spuds back, but I'll not be planting those just in case and the plan for next summer is to grow them under straw and corrugated iron raised beds. That way they're above the ground and they're quite safe. Armed with this data, I will plant more of what worked, adjust conditions for what didn't, and measure again. Now, as I've said earlier, going from an established conventional system to a more biomimicry-based one can be problematic. When Masanobu Fukuoka first applied his ideas to his mandarin orchard, he just left it alone. The orchard, though, had previously been pruned, and by not pruning, leaving things to nature, as it were, the orchard was swamped by insects, and insect pests at that, as the unpruned branches overgrew each other, weakening the plants and leaving them open to pest attacks. So he then began a system of pruning to return the trees to their, in inverted commas, natural shape. Now, just what is the natural shape of a mandarin tree? Can't say I've seen one in the wild. What is the natural shape of any tree, for that matter? So Fukuoka settled on a central leader shape. That is where there's one straight trunk up the middle and the branches come off the sides. As the orchard aged, the older trees were replaced by never pruned trees, which did indeed grow as central leaders. He also replaced one in nine of the fruit trees with a legume, acacias in his case. This brought nitrogen to the orchard through the bacteria on the tree roots rather than the need for chemical end. The process of biomimicry is fraught. Fukuoka's other great insight was with grain growing. Having observed winter grasses in the wild growing up through the decayed straw of the summer grasses in autumn and the reverse happening in spring, he set about to create the process in his own rice field. Oversowing the field with barley or millet two weeks before the rice harvest, he reasoned these winter-hardy cereals would grow through the rice straw once it had been harvested. 
threshed and returned to the field. As he said, he suffered from the Japanese disease of neatness to begin with. He laid the rice straw in tidy, straight lines across the now-growing winter cereal. Nothing happened. He managed to smother the winter growth. Next year, he distributed the rice straw haphazardly across the growing winter cereal shoots, and the system performed as designed. There's a couple of lessons from the rice field in the orchard. Just because it doesn't work the first time and the neighbours are laughing, don't stop. Nature will teach us if we just observe. The courage to hold to our convictions actually makes a difference. And it is especially if those convictions are based on good observation. To that end, the gardens at work and the new gardens at home. I'll be moving from a fully intercrop 15 species garden bed to a more nuanced approach. No, not beds upon beds of the same cultivar, but beds of mixed species, but fewer of them, with more growing space between the plants. How this change will affect the weed metric will be a key performance indicator. The beds at work are spent mushroom compost over cardboard, as I've said. Some have been topped with seaweed, some with vermicompost. The roots of harvested plants have been left in the soil as often as possible more organic matter being the driving principle behind the actions. In the new beds at home, I've laid wet cardboard over the sweepings from the chicken house, straw and droppings. Over the cardboard on top of the chicken waste, I've laid seaweed, about 15 to 20 centimetres, at 6 to 8 inches. Over the seaweed is a thicker layer of horse droppings I've purchased from a house, a horse place down the road. They are good organic types and their stock is healthy, so I'm not importing any veterinary medications or chemical sprays. This layer was about 20 to 30 centimetres deep, so that's 8 to 12 inches in the old money. The whole bed has settled and I have another 15 to 20 centimetres worth of droppings to add. Over all of this, I'm emptying the accumulated organic matter from the duck drinking buckets, and this is lovely stuff, thick, rich and not too smelly gives another organic matter option to the brew that is the garden bed. Now into these uh, concoctions at home, I'll be growing broad beans and wild rockets, cress, silver beet, carrots, broccoli and beetroot, and I'll report on results as they come through over the next six months or so. As far as animals go, we're down to pigs, ducks and chickens at the moment. The pigs are freezer bound and I'll be replacing them with four wieners to get through the rehab on the final half acre in six months, rather than the 12 months it took Jake and Elwood. They have done a great job removing blackberry roots and shoots. The gorse was beyond them but I've managed to remove that by hand. So I'm looking forward to the new piggies doing a number on the last half acre. I always try to integrate animals into the garden system. These plants, or at least their wild ancestors, evolved in conjunction with animals, and again, in an attempt at biomimicry, the animals will play a part in the garden. The pigs prepare, the ducks will clean, and the chickens provide hot manures to use as the base of a raised bed. Between the soil and the cardboard, the hotness of the poultry manure has time to, to cool before the roots in the raised bed no dig garden can reach them. I would suggest that a thoughtful approach, dear listeners, would have you finding solutions and biomimicry options wherever you are. I'd love to hear of your successes or just opinions, if you have any on this approach, and anything you tried that didn't work, and we can work our way through that through some thought experiments. So as I've mentioned over the past few episodes, there's a link to a Udemy course in the show notes entitled Growing a No-Dig Garden if you'd like some more formal assistance in your gardening. Or you can send people there or to episode 207 where I discussed a quick response garden to get things happening quickly. Remember in this unusual time, if we put in the groundwork now, we can all decarbonise the air and recarbonise the soil. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week.